Thank you everyone uh, for joining our first webinar uh, of 2021. Uh, cannot wait to get back with all of you guys. I've really, believe it or not, missed doing webinars. Uh, it's been about a month break since we did our last webinar of 2020. And I have to say, this is for me, as someone who has been a public speaker and in the year 2019 traveled you know, around the world to speak to people, this is something I really look forward to, to have an opportunity to speak to an audience, get feedback, help people um, uncover new insights, inspire people um, as part of their everyday work routine to think differently and to think differently about their business and about you know where they want to take their brand, what they're trying to accomplish in this upcoming year. Um, I'm Matt Britton. I'm the founder and CEO of Suzy. Suzy is now a team of nearly 150 people um, located all across America and in some areas around the world. So I just want to give a special shout out uh, to our Suzy employees who are on this webinar. So incredibly proud of what we've accomplished in 2020 and can't wait to see uh, what's in store for us in the future. But today, we're not here to talk about Susie or me. We are here to talk about uh, 2021 and the consumer, the ever-changing consumer. Anybody who was in business really understood head-on in the year 2020 that you need to have your finger on the pulse of the consumer, that anything you might have believed is sacred in terms of consumer habits have really been thrown out the window. Uh, we have seen a cultural and business and societal change like we've never seen in history. And so many businesses have been uh, really incredibly harmed by this pandemic and others, uh, you know, ironically, really thrived as a result. So what I really want to do today is kind of synthesize all those things, uh, talk about what we've seen so far with the consumer in terms of 2020 and the dramatic changes and what that means looking ahead. You know, we are going into a year, 2021, that's hopefully going to look nothing like 2020. And although we certainly still have the remnants of the pandemic um, and of social unrest and of all the political issues that we've seen, um, we obviously know that things are going to change. We have a new administration coming into the White House. We have a vaccine that's being distributed um, to consumers at varying speeds across uh, America. So without a doubt, those things will change uh, the, the landscape and it will change the consumer. So what I hope to do today is kind of paint, shine a light on that, shine a light on what I think uh, will stay the same, what I think will be part of sort of our new normal, maybe what I think will come back, things that people might have marked for dead that may be coming back. So that's what we're going to be uh, doing today. And I hope, again, all you guys get uh, a lot of value of it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is um, our State of the Consumer webinar series. Uh, this is now our 18th uh, edition of the Suzy State of the Consumer webinar series. Started as just an idea um, in early March of 2020, right when the pandemic was hitting, uh, was hitting obviously this country. And now here we are in mid to late January 2021, and I am still sitting in front of a microphone on a webinar. Um, but it's been again just a great experience, and the the State of the Consumer webinar series really touches all topics. And last year, we did everything from the future of financial services to what the pandemic meant for Halloween, um, to its impact on um, social justice, um, and, and racial equity, and you know, its impact on a variety of different industries from food and beverage to packaged goods to auto, etc. And we're going to continue to do it this year, hopefully even bigger and better. We've, we've taken a lot of your feedback in terms of what you've loved about this webinar. And we really want to double down on that um, in the upcoming year. Um, today, we'll be referencing some uh, research that was conducted on our very own Suzy consumer research platform. Um, the studies that are referenced in today's presentation were conducted in both November and December 2020 with sample sizes of 1,000 Americans. The samples are directionally representative across U.S. consumers and census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. So with that, let's get started. So 2020, what a year, um, you know, a year that obviously we hope to never repeat again. And again, the changes that it wrought on the, on the consumer across every industry uh, has really been unprecedented. Um, as we look ahead, there are certain things that we know won't be the same again. And I think the questions that I've gotten over the past year have been around some really key categories in terms of what does this mean for how consumers are going to shop in the future, communicate in the future, work in the future. Uh, we have a company that, like met all, probably all of you, um, has had to all of a sudden go remote. Will we return to offices again? There's so many large questions, and those are the things I really want to capture um, on today's webinar. So when the, when the pandemic first started, there was a lot of talk and a lot of apt optimists were talking about, uh, you know, a V-shaped recovery. Um, the V-shaped recovery was really 
um, about us having a real big downfall and then again, a real big you know, recovery. And I think what we found through this is that it hasn't been a V-shaped recovery. It's been called what we called a K-shaped recovery. And what we mean by that is that there are certain parts of, of society and of the economy that have recovered just fine. Um, people in the software space, uh, for example, have done just fine during this because they had a business that was really virtual and remote at its core. Where many, you know, workers, especially workers who relied upon going into physical brick and mortar structures every day, well, those have been the people who have really suffered. And unfortunately, what we've seen is those have been the people um, ultimately that fall on the lower end of the socioeconomic scale. So it has disproportionately impacted people that were probably in need prior to this. And I think all of us, no matter what industry we're in, are, are incumbent to try to help those in 2021 recover. Um, as well as we possibly can. Um, I think one of the biggest things that, you know, we, we think that, you know, the company, I mean, sorry, I'm getting some feedback on AV. Let's see, is AV good? I'm seeing some comments coming in that people can't see me. So let's just see, as everyone can see. Abel is telling me that. Okay. Thank you for the feedback. I guess you guys can see me, just the feedbacks to make me a little smaller. Look at that, I'm shrinking by the minute. Um, so I'll make myself a little smaller. Um, some people wanna see more of my face. Some people wanna see more of the slides. We'll do the best we can, bear with us here. Um, so going back to the presentation, um, the NFL and the Super Bowl this year is really gonna be um, a harbinger for, I think, what 2021 is gonna be like. If you think about it, the Super Bowl is the most watched program amongst most males and female viewers um, across the country. This is the one occasion where America gets together. Right now, a very divided America gets together. I happen to think it's a, it's a huge opportunity um, for the NFL to really start to spark optimism amongst consumers. Um, I think that you know, with the vaccine coming out, an idea I posted on LinkedIn, and of course, there's technicalities behind it, is what if uh, the NFL offered all vaccinated healthcare workers on a first come first serve basis to actually attend the Super Bowl. Um, now, obviously, we know the vaccinations are not 100% foolproof, but just imagine a stadium full of healthcare workers cheering for America to see. I think that's something that this country needs right now after everything we've been through in the last year. So I, I'm really curious to see how brands are going to you know, advertise themselves during the Super Bowl, um, what the run up is going to be like in terms of the buzz around it. Because again, this is Last, the last Super Bowl in 2020 was really pre-pandemic. We were starting to talk about it, but you know, it was not really something that had hit America yet. Now here we are a year later, and it's the first Super Bowl during the pandemic. And I'm really curious to see what a pandemic uh, era Super Bowl is going to be like, and again, how brands are going to respond and what roles they really want to play. This year is really going to be a, a story of four seasons. Um, I think that this year is going to be evolving with every season, not really looking anything like the season before. Um, the first uh, season, obviously, is what we're in right now is winter. And I think we're going to have a winter of, of darkness. And I think there's going to be... Um, a lot of pressure on brands to continue inspiring consumers and having them hold on and hold on hope for where we're heading. Uh, the spring, I think we're going to be running into what I call a spring awakening, where I think we're going to have the vaccine distributed in more scale to people across all age groups. And I think with the warm weather, especially um, on the East Coast, I think consumers are going to start to get out there. Um, we'll probably have some consumers that get a little bit too comfortable, but they're going to really start to see the light that this thing might not last forever. Um, in the summer, we're going to have, a, a, I predict, a season of real freneticism. What I mean by that is that people really aren't going to know if they can turn on the light switch to a 2019 era or not. They're not going to know if it's going to be okay to be in crowds again. They're not going to know if it's okay to have a big birthday party for their children. So I think there's going to be a lot of confusion that's going to happen in the summer. And in the fall, I think we're really going to have rejuvenation. I think that you're going to start to see... Um, Offices open up, schools open up, and really consumers try to gravitate towards the life that they won, once knew. So I think that this year is going to be a story that's going to unfold, unfold season by season. And I think from a brand standpoint, I think that you know it creates storytelling opportunities and really creates responsibilities for brands uh, to be able to 
give consumers what they're looking for. So in a winter right now, what consumers really need is hope. I think, you know, we are still in a period where the COVID cases are going up, um, you know, city by city. Um, we've had so much negative headlines out there. And if I'm a brand right now and I am communicating with consumers, I want to give them hope. I want to give them reason to believe that we will face better days ahead. Um, I wouldn't be too salesy in this era. Obviously, in Q4, so many companies had to be very transactionally driven, given holiday shopping, et cetera, and making up for lost numbers in the year. But I really would expect brands to really step in. We're going to be talking a little bit later about how I believe brands will have no choice in 2021, but to really step into the political fold, make political statements. Um, and we've already seen it starting to happen, which we're going to be talking about. But I do think really important forcing hope amongst consumers will be something that the best brands will start to do. Um, I think in the spring, you know, the, the, the tone should really start to shift to optimism, um, making consumers optimistic about the world that we're living in, giving them a little bit more confidence to spend. We're going to be talking a little bit about savings rates still being an all time high amongst us consumers. And I think giving consumers a reason to be optimistic, a reason to get out of the house, a reason to shop a little bit more after we've gotten through the dark winter um, is going to be something that brands are going to want to do to start to spur spending. I do think the new administration coming in, um, we'll be levying quite a stimulus package um, onto the, you know, the U.S. population. And I think we're going to have even more discretionary dollars to be spent. There is pent up demand in so many different categories. And while I don't think that in the spring the vaccine will be mainstream enough where we can go fill a stadium again, I do think businesses will start, start to slowly open. And I think brands are really going to want to spur that economic activity. The summer is going to be a very interesting season because you're going to have kids out of school. You're going to have companies that probably are not open back up yet. And I think that what you're going to start to find is that this is going to be the season when travel is really going to switch a light on. There is so much pent up demand for both domestic and international travel amongst consumers in the United States. And I think you know, the airlines are going to be overwhelmed uh, with demand. I think the hotels are as well. The, both the airlines and the hotels are going to be faced, and the entire hospitality industry is going to be faced with this balancing act. Uh, one On one hand, they're going to want to make up for lost time and lost revenues. On the other hand, there are still going to be um, some safety protocols that they're going to have to adhere to. But I think, as I mentioned earlier, there will also be a lot of freneticism and a lot of confusion in terms of what is acceptable um, in society, uh, you know, is it okay, again, to have a birthday party? Is it okay to, to be around lots of people? Should I still be wearing a mask in every instance? Um, I think we will have a lot more clear information this year, um, just because it's a year later and we have a different administration coming in. But at the same time, um, I do think there will be a lot of confusion. And again, I think in the fall, you will start to see rejuvenation. This picture that I'm showing you actually right now was from South Korea in 2020. Um, this is the, um, uh, the electronic Daisy Carnival um, that actually happened at EDC, where there is tens of thousands of people at a concert. Um, so this is already happening in certain areas around the world. It's actually hard to believe because it seems like it's so far away from us. But I do think that in the fall, you are going to see rejuvenation. I think people are underestimating, um, especially amongst young people, how much they are yearning to be in crowds and, and be together. And the second that many of them have the opportunity to come together at scale and rejoice in what was known as their former life, they are going to do so. I think companies are really starting to plan. I talked to a venture capitalist yesterday who told me his entire portfolio of startups is itching to reopen their offices again. So I think you're going to start to see cities come abuzz as schools open for five days a week and people who are living in cities are going to be coming back there from maybe the summer homes they camped at, out at for a year. I think offices are going to start to open and I do think we're going to see a whiplash effect um, in major cities in terms of the life that, that we once knew um, in the United States. Um, so yeah, again, the, the messaging framework it goes from help in the winter to hope in the spring to inspiration and ultimately to activation is how I think brands need to be looking at it. So I've talked about this during the last webin uh, webinar in terms of the consumer trade-off that we've seen. In 2020, 
consumers had more comfort than ever before. And what I mean by comfort, and of course, this doesn't apply to every consumer and certainly not the consumers that have really been impacted by this pandemic from an economic standpoint. But what we're seeing amongst consumers is savings rates at an all time high. Consumers are spending more time with their family. They have more time in general. They're spending more time on their mental and physical health. And we've seen that with the boom of telehealth. People are home and home equals comfort. And with that, consumers have been in a certain frame of mind. And you see that also play out with companies like Lululemon, who had record years last year in 2020 as the athleisure category and people wanting to dress up in comfy sweatshirts and sweatpants really, you know, boomed. And at the same time, that came at the expense. It came at the expense of less excitement. Consumers weren't traveling. They weren't going to events. Um, they weren't going to restaurants. And there was not really a lot of serendipity, um, not really a lot of new relationships that were created. So I think that trade-off that consumers had no choice of giving in 2020, where they were sort of over-indexing in comfort, under-indexing in excitement, is going to really start to see a shift because it's the it, category of excitement and serendipity is what it that's where all the pent up demand lives right now. And I think that as soon as the valves start to open up and consumers have permission to really um, go towards the path of excitement, you're going to see that happen um, in a very big way. And, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how quickly that happens. And again, what businesses react quickly enough to accept the demand. So today we're really going to be talking about four categories um, that I really want to go through that really, I think, um, you know, encapsulate the questions that people have about the future. Uh, the first is gone for good. These are companies that went away or really struggled during the pandemic that I believe, not just companies, but trends, that I believe will not be coming back. You know, we talk a lot about the pandemic being an accelerator. Um, and I believe that it accelerated some companies to stardom. It's also accelerating a lot of companies um, to the end of their lives and, and a lot of trends to, to kind of wither out to the end. So we're going to be talking about what trends, what companies are gone for good. The second uh, category is don't believe the hype. These are new flash in a pan companies and trends that have come up as a result of this pandemic that I actually believe once the pandemic starts to um, kind of slowly come to an end and we, we get our arms around it as a society, those companies will go away with it. Um, so that's don't believe the hype. The third is don't call it a comeback. Those of you who are LL Cool J fans from the 80s like me uh, and 90s know what this so uh, song is and actually is about companies and trends that will be making a comeback. Uh, companies that went away or really struggled during the pandemic that I believe will be kind of bouncing back. And then lastly, here to stay. Uh, what are the rocket ships that have appeared during the pandemic um, that I believe will continue on their ascent um, even post pandemic. So basically companies that were opportunistic and, and seeing a light or, you know, a window to actually be able to grow during a pandemic that I think now have so much momentum that even the end of the pandemic um, and, and people going back to what was normalized won't stop their ascent. So those are the four categories. Um, we're going to jump into it. As always, my colleague Abel um, is going to be managing questions, which are going to be answered at the end. And by the way, let's all wish Abel a happy birthday today. It's Abel's birthday today. So happy birthday birthday, Abel. Thank you for all you do. Um, we would not be able to put on this State of the Consumer webinar series without you. So uh, with that, let's dive into it and let's talk about companies and trends that are gone for good. So um, we all know what the pandemic has done to e-commerce. This is the one slide that I have probably mentioned the most um, during the webinar series, which is that E-commerce has accelerated as much in an eight-week period from March to April 2020 than it did for the 10 years prior. You could see um, it, way back in 2019, um, only 6% of all commerce was actually done over the web and e-commerce. And over a 10-year period, it grew from 6% to 16%, jumping about 10 points. But then in an eight-week period from March and April 2020, it went from 16% all the way up to 27%, 10 years of growth in eight weeks. So the question becomes, what happens when people can go to stores again? Will e-commerce continue to grow at that rate? I've seen so many times, to me, laughably, companies like Shopify and Amazon um, being grouped in with what they call pandemic stocks like Zoom and Peloton. But I actually think that 
couldn't be further from the case. I believe that e-commerce is something that um, is going to be here for a very long time. And because of that, and the acceleration that the pandemic has brought on to e-commerce, I think many companies that have struggled uh, in the last year um, really won't see a window out. So, you know, you see, you've seen these pictures before of shopping malls where nature has kind of started to take over. Um, shopping malls right now in, in many places are really sort of ground zero of the impact that e-commerce has had on business. Um, if you think about it, many companies that used to reside in shopping malls were the specialty retailers, the companies that um, sold uh, products in one uh, category when and what consumers have started to do is shift over to more uh, e-commerce based platforms versus having to shop at five to 10, 15 different stores um, in a trip because saving time is something in this comfort based area that many consumers have kind of grown accustomed to. These are all the businesses, a list of all the businesses that have went out um, of business uh, during the year 2020, Guitar Center, Century 21, Century 21 being um, a New York City based uh, department store that was, um, you know, a lower price department store. And, you know, they didn't have a good enough e commerce platform. So, what happened with a company like Century 21 is they got blindsided during the pandemic um, because they couldn't really shift online. When comp where you see companies like Nike and Lululemon um, and so many other businesses that had a vibrant online infrastructure, they were able to flip the switch. But a lot of these companies didn't, and it really sort of did them in. And you know, there's talk about some of these companies recovering from bankruptcy, and we're going to see. But I think so many specialty retailers are really going to have a hard time digging out of this, as well as so many department stores. And there's a big difference between department stores and big box retailers like Walmart and Target, who are actually thriving during this era. Uh, department stores, really, generally speaking, weren't known for being, you know, uh, uh, having the variety that the big box retailers had, you know, the price efficiencies, et cetera. And I think many department stores like JC Penney are going to have a hard time digging out of this um, as well. So I wouldn't expect a resurgence of specialty retail uh, during this. In fact, Fortnite, which those of you who have um, kids that are between ages 10 to 15, like I do, you'll know that Fortnite has become an obsession during the pandemic. In fact, it's doing so good that um, Epic Games, the, the company behind Fortnite, uh, recently made the decision to convert an abandoned or, or you know, a, the troubled shopping mall into its headquarters. So think about that. You have a company um, in North Carolina taking over a shopping mall to make it into its corporate headquarters. And that company is an online digital game. So this headline to me sort of summarizes both the issues that specialty retailers are facing and the opportunities that we're seeing in other sectors of the economy, more so on the digital and virtual side. I do think you're going to see some retailers also start to react to the pandemic to create different types of form factors. So this is uh, Walmart that's just a 24-hour um, pickup store. All Walmart has at this location is the ability to pick up. Um, they know that the, what the pandemic brought on, although they have done very well um, in the past year is that many consumers still don't want to be in crowds, don't want to be around a lot of people, but Walmart still needs to do business. And um, they know some consumers want their products the same day. So what you see here is a 24 hour uh, Walmart pickup location where you can uh, order online and pick up in store. Um, that's called BOPIS, which is a new term I learned last year, buy online, pick up in store. I think you're going to see a lot more of this. And I think the companies that are going to do it are the ones that are going to thrive moving forward and mostly going to be the ones who really survive well through this. You see Starbucks doing it as well. Um, Starbucks, those of you who go to Starbucks frequently like myself, know that the tables and chairs at Starbucks have been covered up. They have these huge footprints of nicely done uh, coffee shops where people used to sit in Starbucks on their laptops and do work. And obviously the pandemic has sort of gotten rid of that trend. And now people just want to go in the Starbucks, get their coffee as quickly as they can and leave. Um, this was Dunkin', Dunkin Donuts strategy against Starbucks for a very long time. But Dunkin Donuts had a strategy, America runs on Dunkin'. It was about the, the worker that was on the run that had to actually run in, pick up the coffee and leave. Starbucks was about a brand experience. They were about people hanging out in stores. But what Starbucks starting to see is they had such rapid adoption of their mobile app that with people ordering, running in, grabbing the coffee and leaving, that now Starbucks is rolling out um, hundreds of locations 
locations that are just built to be mobile pickup areas. So I think these companies, again, that had the digital ecosystem and infrastructure going into this are going to double down in relation to their footprint. And it's going to come at the peril of companies that didn't going into this. And it's going to only accelerate companies such as this. There's other categories too, like um, you know, pharmacies and over-the-counter uh, subscriptions, uh, prescriptions that I think are really going to struggle in the traditional form. I think traditional pharmacies where consumers go in uh, with their prescription and have to actually have to pick up medication, I think in 2021 and beyond will largely be looked at as a thing in the past. There's companies like Capsule. There's companies like GoodRx. Even Amazon recently talked about getting into the pharmaceutical space. And the notion that consumers can press a button um, to actually have their monthly prescriptions delivered to their homes without having to wait in line around people who could be sick because they're going to pick up medicine, I think that's a thing of the past. And I think you know a lot of the pharmacies are, are really going to have to, who haven't yet, are really going to have to pivot their business. I know Walgreens, for one, has done a really good job at pivoting to digital, but there are definitely front runners like GoodRx, like Capsule. And again, I think Amazon will get in this space. And I think you will start to see the end of what we knew as a traditional pharmacy. I think pharm uh, you know, pharmaceuticals are going to be delivered from central locations, um, all delivered to consumers, uh, you know, via digital means. And, and, you know, for, especially for the elder population who has to go to pharmacies um, and, you know, put themselves out there, I think this could be a great thing. And I think this is going to be something that's going to accelerate uh, moving forward. The entertainment space has been dramatically impacted um, in the year 2020. And it was really brought to a head when Warner Brothers late last year said that all 2020 films, 2021 films are going to be streamed right away on HBO Max. So here you have one of the largest movie studios saying, we're not going to just release our movies to, uh, to theaters anymore. At the same time they go to theaters, all HBO Max subscribers are going to have the ability to watch these movies. This is something that many consumers have want has wanted for a very long time. The the kind of business model um, of Hollywood and the movie studios in the past just didn't allow it. It didn't allow uh, theaters to basically be in some way shunned by these streaming services. But now we're going to start to see it, and we're only going to start to see it accelerate. One thing that's interesting to me, however, is that what I think the movie studios and a lot of entertainment companies are doing is they're embracing vertical models. So Warner brothers are going to stream to HBO max because they own it. And I think other um, streaming services, Peacock is taking the NBC universal Comcast offerings and they're going to be streaming it directly. So you're seeing companies try to own the entire supply chain. They're owning the content and they're owning the distribution. And while I think this is a good business model I think it's going to create a lot of confusion for consumers. One thing that's been brought about by consumers being more in demand of streaming services is just a ton of confusion. People don't know what app, what show is on, how to download the app, if they're paying a subscription, if they're not, some people get it for free some, with their cell phone service, and it's just way too much confusion for consumers. So I think it's going to be um, on the industry to really sort out some of these issues with this sort of vertical distribution strategy, because while I think, again, it might work for Warner Brothers and their sister company, HBO, for many consumers, they just want to log onto a television and watch what they want to watch. So it works for the companies. It doesn't really work for the consumers. And I think you're going to start to see a lot of innovation um, in this area moving forward, because one thing is for sure, consumers love watching TV in their homes, TVs are cheaper than ever. We're going to talk about television um, in a second. They are spending more money on home theater systems as they're in their homes more. Um, but And the big question is, what will become of the movie theaters? Um, I've said this now for a very long time. I think that companies like Netflix and Hulu and the large streaming services are going to start to purchase movie theaters and movie theater chains. And the reason why I believe this is that if we've seen nothing from Apple, it's creating a physical brand experience can be a very powerful way to, to drive more brand equity and drive more touch points with consumers. Netflix is an incredible business. Hulu is an incredible business. But these companies and HBO don't really have areas where you can touch and feel the brand. And I look at movie theaters as sort of the penultimate way for brands to take their content in a very immersive experience as a lost leader, meaning 
they, Netflix doesn't need to make money from the movie theaters. They could subsidize, you know, the 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 cookie dough bites. They could subsidize, um, you know, the, the cost of the build out of the theater because it's just an and it could only be for people who are members of their service. So I would definitely look for this to start to happen, and I think you're going to start to see it across the board. You're going to see. Uh, rich, very well-to-do software and technology companies start to eat up brick and mortar infrastructure as a loss leader. Uh, the first company that started to do it that comes to mind is Warby Parker, who built an incredible e-commerce business selling eyeglasses. Then they start to build, um, you know, in these, uh, you know, very fast-growing cities and, and city areas physical retail stores. And in many instances, they did it because they just wanted another touch point. Um, it wasn't really driving most of their business. Most of the business was still online. And they were very successful in doing it and gave people more trust in the brand. So I think you have companies with a ton of money on their balance sheet, technology companies. You have old world legacy brick and mortar retailers that are struggling. And I just think it's obvious that a lot of these companies are going to come in and start to eat up a lot of this brick and mortar infrastructure, again, to have uh, broader touch points uh, for consumers. So I think that will be very interesting, obviously, moving forward. Um, the office. So this is a very, I, I googled picture of very expensive law firm boardroom. And this is what came up. Um, so, and why I did that is I think when you think of so many service businesses, you know, so much of their cost, whether you look at financial services or legal services, you know, these companies had put so much money into the look and feel of their offices where they conducted business. The same way why I believe Netflix is going to purchase movie theaters. It's the same reason why, you know, a, a financial services firm would invest in a conference room that looked like this. They wanted consumers to touch and feel their service brand in a way that represented what they were all about. And why I think offices are still going to survive and thrive, and we will get into that. I think the days of service businesses, expensive service businesses, doing expensive build outs so they can bring customers and clients into their offices. I actually don't think those days are going to come back again because I think what's starting to happen in the service businesses is it's obviously it's getting digitized. You know, if you instead of going to your accountant's office, it is so much easier for you to connect, uh, you know, on a platform like Xero um, or Quicken, all your financial information and just pop up on a screen 24 hours a day with an accountant. Let them look through, um, you know, your financial information and help you make tax decisions. You will never need to go into an accountant's office again. Uh, your law firm that might be very expensive um, or your financial service wealth advisor, you will never need to go into their office again. All these old world legacy businesses have been forced during a pandemic to accelerate their adoption of digital and their adoption um, of new technologies, which allows them to collaborate with their customers um, in a virtual format. And I think this is going to put a lot of pressure on commercial real estate. You know, I do think many companies will be opening offices, Susie included. But I think when you look at the square footage in commercial real estate in major cities, so much of it is taken up by legacy old world financial services. Um, oriented businesses, legal oriented businesses. And it's those service businesses, which actually, in my opinion, needs fancy square footage the least moving forward. And I think that's something that's definitely going to be accelerating uh, during 2021. Even uh, you know, consumer banks um, and retail banking locations like this Wells Fargo location you see right here, I have a hard time understanding how there's an ROI model there. If you walk into a retail bank, you know, you will see people sitting at desks waiting for customers to walk by and have, you know, conversations on the chance that 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 representative is available because no one likes to wait in line anymore, right? And talk to them about maybe the mortgage you want or a new line of credit that you want to open up. But that's not how really consumers in this new age are looking for mortgages. Consumers that are looking for mortgages are going to go to something like Rocket Mortgage and they're going to search and they're going to search, you know, 20 different providers based upon their credit score. Consumers that are looking for insurance are going to go to new fintech services like Lemonade and they're going to search. And I think obviously a lot of the traditional banks are acquiring fintech services. Um, the Trump administration definitely uh, levied a lot of deregulation in the financial services industry, which made fintech a lot more of, you know, a viable option for acquisition by these companies. But I think 
none of this supports the old world model of having these physical banking structures. I, you know, one day we might not even see ATM machines anymore as, as consumers use their phone as a payment tool. We're not there yet, but I think you're going to start to see a lot of companies wind down these physical banking locations uh, just because it's not an efficient way and it's not how consumers really want to do business with them. So this week should be the week, and it's the week I'm usually in Las Vegas at the Consumer Electronics Show, uh, one of 100,000 people. I went last year in 2020, seems like uh, worlds ago. And you know, when you look at the future of business travel, I think you have to question if it's going to continue in its current, in its pre-pandemic form. I believe that business travel will still exist, and I believe it's still going to be important for people to have a physical face-to-face communication with customers. But what I'm not so sure of is if companies are going to send 600 people um, or you know 50 salespeople to a show like CES anymore and stand at a booth and hoping that people are going to walk by the right person at the right time, that the right conversation with them at the expense of spending millions of dollars and time and effort on creating a booth like this. I think that what we've seen with our company during this pandemic, and one of the reasons why we're doing this webinar today, is it's such an efficient way to build our brand, to add value, and to drive our business. And we can do so instantly without putting anybody on an airplane. Um, we can target the right people who we want to join this webinar. We can follow up with them. We can add value in a way that's so much more efficient, not taking people away from their families, et cetera. And while I think there's tremendous value in building deep interpersonal relationships, I think big conferences like uh, the Consumer Electronics Show or like um, you know the Cannes Advertising Festival that happens every year. Um, is it Cannes or Con? I always get it wrong, but you know what I'm talking about. Those I question because as a CEO of a company that obviously knows that cash and capital is king, I'm going to think twice about sending you know, 20 of our salespeople to a conference when I know how efficient we can be virtually. So I do think conferences will continue, but look at for 2021 and beyond for conferences to be a bit more exclusive um, and you know, a bit more intentional versus wandering around amongst 100,000 people looking for a needle in a haystack to drive your business. I think another thing that's going to change part and parcel with this is that consumers are going to find it a lot harder to travel internationally. So while there is tremendous pent up demand amongst U.S. consumers to travel to Europe um, you know, because they've been unable to do so. The thing that many don't realize about the travel industry is the reason that there are so many cheap flights to Europe is because they were subsidized by business class seats that companies paid to send their executives to Europe. And since I believe that many of this international large scale business travel will be really grinding down dramatically, what that means is going to be less subsidies. And with oil, um, the price of oil not going down anytime soon because demand is so low right now, you take, take those two things combined. One, you know, lack of a chance of oil prices going down. Two, less international business travel. And what you're going to find is those $500 round, class, round trip class tickets to Europe will soon be $1,500. And many young people will find it's largely inaccessible for them to travel. And that kind of takes us back. I mean, when I was growing up, you know, when I was 18, 19, 20 years old, I didn't know anyone who had been to Europe. And now kids who are 18 years old are jumping on a plane because they can go on the kayak and search for flights. I do think that along with just the United States standing around the world right now, um, and really just, you know, a very, um, you know, tense geopolitical climate, I think you're going to find that many consumers will be doing far less international travel in the years ahead. Don't believe the hype. What companies have really exploded um, during 2020 that I think are going to cool off a little bit? So Zoom. Now, no, I don't think Zoom is going to go away. Zoom is an incredible business. And Zoom is a company that has enabled so many of us to really operate remotely in such an effective form in 2020. And it has now become a verb amongst so many companies, et cetera. So I don't think Zoom's going away. But I also don't think Zoom is going to replace everything. I don't think Zoom is going to replace the office. I don't think it's going to replace the school. I don't think it's going to replace weddings or birthday parties or any of those things moving forward. And I, it's shocking to me that people believe that that will be the norm for so many activities moving forward, where I think it is a really good um, you know, Band-Aid for a really bad wound that we had that I think is going to be ripped off um, day by day as we 
heal as a nation uh, from this pandemic. Uh, remote learning. So many companies like Microsoft with their Teams product um, and Zoom have really innovated to try to make remote learning um, more digestible for, for young kids. But research after research, and our own research has showed um, that students have an incredibly hard time connecting uh, with their teachers and other classmates in a digital format. And I don't think school is going to now be four or three days a week. I think you're going to find schools be the first to reopen. I think the fall, you're going to see 90 to 95% of schools reopen uh, to full capacity with children in schools, because I think this is going to be long-term one of the most harmful aspects of the pandemic is it took kids during their developmental years out of the classroom. Um, and in a world where there's endless distractions, in a world where you have many, um, you know, two income households where both parents had to work during the day. No one could watch the kid. No one's helping them. You know, it's become a big struggle for, for really everybody involved. And I think you're going to see this whiplash back. So while I believe certain aspects of online learning will be here for good, I don't think schools will. The office has probably been the biggest point of, con you know, contention amongst people who are trying to figure out the future. You know, you have one half of people who believe People are so efficient. Nobody wants to commute. What's the point of going to their office? They don't like the people that they work with. You know, work remotely and you can live a much better life. And then you have the other half of the people, and I am personally in this camp, that believe that great companies are built on great culture and great culture is built on trust and relationships. And trust and relationships can only really be created in person. And I believe that especially younger employees find moving into a city and going into an office, really a rite of passage. It's where many of them meet lifelong friends. It's where some of them meet sp future spouses. Um, and it's where, really where they learn and listen and develop their skills because they are around people that are more senior than themselves. If you think about it, if you are staring at a screen the whole day, you can't observe other people. You can't see how they work. You can't overhear things. And I know we've talked forever about serendipity. So I think that many of the most progressive businesses and many of the businesses that understand the value of culture and, and we're thriving based on culture before this are going to be the first ones to dive back into an office environment. Now, all that being said, I don't think this is going to go back to the way it was. Um, I do think that you know working from home will no longer be a taboo. I think that the way we're looking at it is if people are just going to email all day, they can do that from home. It's really about collaboration. But I do think you are going to see companies come back into offices, rebuild their culture, rebuild their, their learning. Um, and basically, it will force many people who have, you know, led an exodus to the suburbs to rethink those decisions uh, moving forward. This is a photo of a, a of the offsite that we did at Suzy, um, you know, in the fall, early in the fall before there was a new spike in the New York area. And we all did an outdoor offsite. And there was 70 people that came to it. And there were people who had worked for a company that I'd never seen before. And, you know, one guy was incredibly tall and I had no idea because I've only seen him shoulder up in Zoom meetings. Um, but I can tell you that one event for our company really helped us get through the winter. And I think that really just shows the value of being around other people and the value of culture in a business. Um, with, with people questioning the future of the office, many people are also questioning the future of cities. You know, we have seen a tremendous amount of people during the pandemic and for good reason, move out of major cities, especially cities like San Francisco and New York, which were very expensive and had many people living there just because of the proximity uh, to the offices. I believe that this is all connected. I think that as companies start to reopen um, their offices, which I do believe will happen, you know, you will see surrounding businesses start to um, definitely uh, benefit from that. I do think, you know, this new administration is going to raise taxes and they are going to put more money back into the cities. That's just a fact. Um, I don't get into politics on these webinars. If those of you who are new to this, but you know, there will be more money being poured in the cities to actually help. Uh, a lot of them are really starving right now. And I think as a result, you aren't going to see the suburban exodus that you thought of. But I do think 
the success of U.S. cities is going to be smoothed out. I think that cities like New York and San Francisco are now going to have to contend. You know, on one hand, you have Facebook, who just took over a huge lease um, in New York City um, by Penn Station, the brand new, brilliant Penn Station that was built. Amazon built a new, huge office infrastructure in the NYC area as well. You see companies like Oracle relocating to Texas. You see companies like Dropbox relocating. I think they went to either Miami or Texas. It seems that Austin and Miami are the two places um, because of much lower tax rates, because of better weather, that many of these companies are going to start to move um, into. And you have other emerging markets like Salt Lake City, um, which has a lot of emerging tech companies. So I think you're going to start to see pressure on this New York, San Francisco, Seattle, LA, where all the big companies are. I do think more young people are going to want to live in these secondary and tertiary cities because they're much more affordable. And I do think that it's going to put pressure on New York and San Francisco, but I don't think it's going to mean that people are going to move out of the cities. And we've talked about that, but I think, so I think you're going to start to see booms in a lot of secondary cities. I, I would really expect to see that um, in the upcoming year. And it's already certainly started to happen um, in places like Austin, Texas. Another prediction about a flash in the pan, no pun intended, is I think online delivery services like DoorDash are really going to hit headwinds in 2021. Because I think as restaurants start to reopen, and as so many consumers have now gotten used to cooking in their own homes, I think those are the two things that are going to be really strong. So I think in-home cooking is going to be something that continues. And we're going to talk about the data behind that. And I think restaurants, given the pent up demand that we've talked about, is going to take a lot of share of wallet. And I think it's all going to come at the cost of growth of a company like DoorDash, which was the hottest IPO of the year. So I think that's one of the companies that probably will struggle more often than not in the coming year. Come back. Who's going to be coming back? So we talked a little bit earlier about savings rates. How savings rates are at now all time highs. Um, you know, in in the year 2021, it actually savings rates as a percentage of personal income um, was up to nearly 35 percent at one level, literally off the charts. Now it's come back down to earth a little bit, but consumers certainly have more discretionary um, funds at their disposal than they've had as long as we can remember in our lifetimes, um, which is really ironic given the economy that we're in right now and how so many people are struggling, but it is just the case. I think you're going to see companies like Amazon report incredible numbers from the fourth quarter based upon just dramatic spending in e-commerce. And we saw Etsy recently uh, report great results. So I think that it just shows that there is so much pent up demand right now. 57% um, of people are saving the same or more uh, since the start of the pandemic. So again, people are just saving uh, so much money. So where are they going to spend it? So they're going to spend it on places they can feel emotionally connected and alive because we're going to start to see again that shift from a world that was over-indexing in comfort to a world where consumers are going to start to gravitate towards excitement. This is a concert from last year by the band The Flaming Lips where everybody was in a bubble and they watched The Flaming Lips perform in a bubble. This is not the future of concerts. Um, it was amazing that they were able to pull off this publicity stunt. But the reality is that young people are yearning to be inspired, to be connected, to have that serendipity and those experiences and memories that make life worth living. And as a result, I do think you're going to start to see the pent up demand for travel, which American Express CEO said he'd seeing dramatic pent up demand uh, for travel. You're going to really see that explode. And again, in terms of the timeline, the summer is going to be where some of those valves uh, really open up. Um, Coachella, people are now starting to think about this is in April, um, a huge event. Now, I can't get the timing exactly right. Will the vaccine have enough distribution where people can go to an outdoor concert festival like Coachella in April? That may be a little too soon, but I think these large concert festivals will be roaring back this year. And I think really the fall is a time um, where you're going to start to see more and more people go to these large scale uh, concert festivals. Um, and I think that this is a big part of youth and the pent up demand that we're really going to start to see um, levied. I think restaurants are going to be roaring back. If we saw nothing during this pandemic, it was that people were willing to be in bubbles and sitting outside, freezing cold, pretending like they weren't freezing cold, just so they can go outside and go to a restaurant. If people are willing to do that in the freezing cold, imagine what a 
population that has more discretionary expenditures than they've ever had that haven't been to a restaurant in over a year are going to do when they can start to go back to indoor dining and feel safe with doing so. So I think companies that can create these experiences um, like Tao Group, who's done an amazing job, friends of mine who built this incredible restaurant infrastructure, which gives people the right level of experience. They'll be willing to spend their money. I think there's going to be a huge rebound of companies like this uh, moving forward because I think that the pen up the man calls for it. And this isn't just amongst youth. It's really amongst um, all consumer sets. Broadway. So Broadway is going to be something that we will have to see. To me, this is going to be the last entertainment form factor. It's going to come back just because it's so shoulder to shoulder. So in, in poorly ventilated venues that um, have not been uh, upgrade, upgraded in a very long time. But once Broadway is back, you know that America is back in many instances because I think it's going to be the last thing to come back. I think the I would put it at less than 50%. We're going to see uh, Broadway come back during 2021, but I would put it at over 90% that it'll come back during 2022, but hopefully it'll come back sooner uh, than we believe. College life. Um, I wouldn't believe the hype that college life is over. I know that many are saying that young people aren't going to want to go to colleges anymore, that they don't um, believe that colleges are, are a big part of um, you know their life and their future. I think college for many people that can afford it is a rite of passage. And I think that kids are not going to stop their dreams that they've had since they were 10 years old to go to college because of one year not being able to go to college. And I think many college and universities um, will start to refill um, their enrollment heading into 2022. And I don't think this is going to be something that's going to go away. Rental cars. So Hertz is a company that went bankrupt during the year 2020, which to me was shocking because to me, I would have thought that companies like this would have boomed during this time because people aren't going on trains. They're not going on airplanes. They're looking at places to escape. Many young people did not own cars and relied on Uber pre-pandemic. I think rental car companies are going to be coming back. And I think that they're going to be, um, I, I hope the Hertz brands comes, comes back because I was a um, loyal customer of Hertz. But I think more and more young people, they may not buy cars although I think many will be buying cars after they've seen this. And I think they're going to be renting cars um, at scale. And I think they're going to be slightly less uh, comfortable getting into an Uber and a lot more likely to be renting cars. So I think the car rental space is one that's going to see a lot of growth ahead of it just based upon consumers doing more domestic travel and jumping in cars more to do it as well. Rent the Runway. Rent the Runway is a business that I talked about a ton prior to the pandemic where people, um, women can basically subscribe to a service um, for a couple hundred dollars a month and some instances less where they can basically pick up garments and they can wear it to work. And when they're done, they can return it. And it's almost like net how Netflix used to be with DVDs. And this company obviously got kind of punched in the face during the pandemic as less people um, had to get dressed up for work. I think it's not just about workwear. It's about people feeling, um, you know, the their best form and their most creative self. And I do think rent the runway, and I think online clothing rental is a market that has been really devastated by this. That will come roaring back as people have a reason to get dressed up and go out again in the future. So, what is here to stay? What what brands really did well during this? And I'm moving over so you can see the logo, but you get it. Um, Airbnb is here to stay. I think every trend that we've talked about today, um, you know, international travel being more expensive, domestic travel being much more in demand, rental car companies doing better, people needing to connect with one another, people wanting to explore. I think for all those reasons, more and more people are going to look to Airbnb type models to go on vacation. I think 2020. Uh, one will be the year of Airbnb and the year of many people driving to different places around the country um, and maybe up to Canada and down to Mexico to be able to travel. Because I, again, I don't think international travel is going to have quite the rebound that domestic will. And I think the core beneficiary in a world where many people don't want to be in lobbies or, or elevators with lots of people just yet, I think Airbnb becomes the huge beneficiary of this moving forward. I think the, and with that, that, you know, really the revival and continued revival of, you know, the American road trip, uh, which is something that if the pandemic didn't have such a strong wave in the West Coast over the summer, we probably would have seen um, even more of. Um, E-commerce obviously has become from being an optional thing to um, something that's really mandatory for every company. If you are not a, if your company does not sell stuff online, 
efficiently and you don't understand how to do it and you don't have the infrastructure to behind it, you're really going to find yourself in a place where you're probably not going to survive in the next three to five years, no matter how strong your brand is. Um, and you'll probably be out of business sooner. A company like Shopify, which has done tremendously well, uh, one of the best performing stocks um, in, on the NASDAQ, really empowers every company to be an e-commerce company. And the reason why many companies have gravitated towards Shopify uh, versus a platform like Amazon is Shopify allows you to collect your own first party data. And one thing we're starting to see in the digital world um, is the death of cookies and, and the ability for companies to be able to retarget efficiently um, on web browsers. And what that means is that first party data for companies is more important than ever before. So Amazon does not let you collect your customer information. So if you sell something online on Amazon, it's Amazon's data, not yours. It's their platform. Where a platform like Shopify, you control everything and you can collect the customer information. And for that reason, I think you're going to start to see many brands rethink their strategy. And I think 2021 is going to be a year where Shopify becomes a real competitor to Amazon um, as many companies start to take e-commerce into their own hands, not just throw stuff up on Amazon. And Nike, you know, you know, long a company that had been breaking boundaries was the first company to really do this, making a decision to double down direct to consumer and actually taking many of their products off of Amazon to bring the Nike.com to sell directly. And, and we've seen this year, Nike's performance really go through the roof. Their stock is at an all time high. And they did that by taking their products off of Amazon. So it shows now, obviously not every brand is like Nike, right? But it just shows that companies are rethinking these strategies. They want to be able to control how their brand is perceived um, digitally, and they want to be able to own the customer data. And I think you're going to start to see more and more of that happen. And the biggest beneficiary, I do think, is Shopify, which is sort of like the alternative platform for companies that want to sell online. One of the biggest events during 2020, um, going back to Fortnite, was Fortnite, one of the largest uh, digital games, hosted a concert with Travis Scott, uh, one of the most popular performing artists in the world. And 12.3 million people with an M watched this concert. And it just shows the power of these platforms. And it really shows how a lot of the entertainment companies have to rethink how they go to market. Um, food and beverage you know, the shifts that we've seen have been dramatic. We work with some of the biggest food and beverage companies in the world. And, you know, what was happening in the food and beverage space prior to the pandemic is we we were seeing a shift that had been happening for 50 years where you know it used to be that everyone ate at home so you can see that's the blue line that was higher and then over time less and less people ate at home and more and more people ate away from home and then what we actually saw in 2020 is those trends reverse right because almost everybody was eating at home I think that this trend is going to continue to reverse moving forward. I think many consumers have realized the beauty and efficiency and health benefits of cooking their own food. And many people who had no idea how to cook going into it are now great chefs coming out of it. I am not one of those people. I still don't know how to cook. But many people have figured it out. And I think it creates a big opportunity for many brands. 75% uh, of consumers now say they're more skilled in the kitchen than ever before. And- at the same time, while more and more cute people are cooking at home, I think supermarkets are in big trouble because of platforms like Instacart. Um, groceries was one area that many consumers in the past had sort of held off on shopping online. They wanted to touch and feel the produce. They wanted to go into grocery stores. During the pandemic, they weren't able to. So they leveraged a tool like Instacart that allowed them to get one-hour grocery delivery, having people go into the grocery store for them and pick up their food. Instacart is a phenomenon. And Instacart is something that I think is only going to continue to grow in popularity um, in, the, in the coming year. And I think this is a trend that you're going to see only accelerate. I think more and more people will get comfortable with buying their groceries online. And I think that's going to only accelerate the movement of people cooking at home because it becomes that much easier to get the ingredients into your kitchen. I just don't think they're going to be going into supermarkets as much uh, moving forward. And the liquor space with companies like Drizzly, we've seen it as well, is that more many consumers didn't even know how to get uh, liquor online because that wasn't a category Amazon dove into. Now, many of them know, and, and you're seeing a huge shift uh, for liquor sales online uh, during 2020. It was one of the fastest growing categories in the past year. This is only to continue um, heading into next year.
And the home improvement home space is another one that I think is only going to continue. 83% of consumers made home improvements during the pandemic. Um, people's homes were their new restaurant, their new um, place of work. It was their kid's new school. It was their new gym. And I think that you're only going to continue to see that um, accelerate in the coming year because while offices may open, it's not going to be five days a week. Many consumers have invested in larger homes. Mortgage rates are at an all-time low. And because of that, we saw a huge influx of home buying and many consumers are still trying to figure out how to improve or update their existing homes or new ones they just bought. Um, and I think companies like the messaging of Home Depot, which isn't really their tagline anymore, but the whole, you can do it, we can help. I think this is going to be the role of so many new brands. As consumers rely less on services or maybe veer towards digital services, they're going to rely um, on companies to help them do their home improvements, but not necessarily do it for them. So brand is an enabler. I think you're going to start to see uh, more and more of. And then lastly, the last trend I think that you're going to see from 2020 really accelerate is you're going to start to see more companies in the apparel space, um, the fitness space, even the electronic space start to buy um, hardware and startups so they can actually have more of a 360 um, kind of touch point with their consumer. Uh, in 2020, Lululemon bought a company called Mirror, which is a connected uh, fitness device. It's a mirror that you look at and there's a trainer that pops up. Um, they bought it for $500 million, which is um, not a huge investment for a company like Lululemon. But now all of a sudden they have hardware that basically can um, connect with their software offering, which is their athleisure apparel. I think you're going to start to see more companies like Nike invest in these technology aimed startups. We saw it way back in the day with Nike rolling out their Nike ID, you know, connected watch product. They were one of the first companies to jump into it. I think you're going to start to see more and more of this. I think you're going to start to see food and beverage companies buy companies that make blenders and things of that nature, but they'll be connected blenders so they can get more first-party data, have their products in the home, et cetera. So companies getting into more technology, companies getting into more um, hardware that maybe weren't in the past is going to be a trend I think you're only going to see continue um, in the coming year. I also think subscription services are going to be things that are only going to continue in the food and beverage space. Panera had a uh, very sort of uh, widely covered launch of something called My Panera Coffee, which is $9 a month and unlimited coffee. You can go anytime and grab as much coffee as you want. Um, I thought this was a brilliant strategy. Uh, it, it brings consumers into the store. As we all know, you go in for your free coffee that you paid for. Um, you know, your subscribed coffee, I should say. And you're, obviously you're going to buy the extra pastry. You're going to buy the extra breakfast sandwich, et cetera. Um, if we see nothing from these large internet companies, we've seen that subscription revenue works. Um, Disney had a dramatic increase in its stock price once they really doubled down on Disney+. Plus. I think the food and beverage space, especially QSRs, are really going to dive into subscriptions. And I think Starbucks is going to be a company that I predict will be jumping into subscription space moving forward because they have so many loyal customers and it just makes so much sense that they should launch a subscription where you get a certain type of coffee, um, you know, as much as you want, as long as you subscribe to their service. Apple recently got in the subscription services as well. But I think in the QSR space, in the food and beverage space, you're going to start to see that happen uh, more and more. And then telehealth. I think we talked earlier about not only consumers uh, wanting to uh, not go in the pharmacies anymore to get their pharmaceuticals, I think many of them are not going to want to go in the doctor's offices unless they absolutely need to. And we've seen companies like Teladoc and ZocDoc really explode during the pandemic as many doctor offices didn't even allow visitors. And now many consumers are comfortable with telehealth. And I think this is another trend that you're only going to see explode in the coming year. So moving forward on the, on the horizon, just to wrap this up, I know we're tad over time. Here's some other things I just wanted to throw out there of things that didn't necessarily happen in 2020 or maybe just start to happen that I think you could really expect to happen at scale during the year of 2021. I'll just try to rapid fire these things off. Uh, first and foremost, I do think cryptocurrency, Bitcoin is going to be something that is going to really start to go mainstream. Um, you saw uh, Jack Dorsey's company Square uh, make a huge investment in their balance sheet um, as cryptocurrency. You're starting to see a lot of the major banks starting to accept it um, as a global currency. And I think something that was really looked at as sort of hacky when it launched and something that couldn't be trusted is going to be something that's going to start to get slowly adopted by big companies like Apple and Google um, and Amazon as a real 
type of currency. I think 2021 is the year cryptocurrency finally goes mainstream, gets accepted amongst consumers and Fortune 500 companies as a real currency um, because it's so much in demand, uh, especially by younger and millennial consumers. I think identity is going to be taking a much larger um, role on the web. I think what we've seen during the recent uh, you know, political issues that we've seen play out is identity is something that right now is, is, is really a primary importance. And I think a lot of the social platforms are going to start to really push consumers to truly identify who they are versus hiding through fake uh, usernames and screen names. And this will come at a cost of privacy. But I think ultimately these 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 platforms are going to have no choice but to go in this direction. And I think you're going to see many new platforms really launch um, around the whole concept of identity on the web. Um, I think it's going to become more and more important. Uh, so what was once the you know the wild west in terms of anybody can set up any screen name and hide behind a keyboard, I think it's going to become less and less uh, common. I think. Twitter is going to be a company that's really going to embrace identity and slowly go to more of a subscription based model um, where, you know, they're going to ask people to be part of Twitter plus where you can pay to become part of Twitter plus and do so you, you essentially um, reveal your identity and then you, you have access uh, to certain things that non subscribe users won't. Uh, so I think you're going to have see many of these platforms start to go into subscription. It makes a whole lot of sense, especially with what we've seen, um, you know, over the past couple months with, um, you know, people, you know, creating all sorts of trouble online. I, I think that you're going to start to see the platforms really um, start to go against that moving forward. I think that many uh, journalists are going to go off on their own. I think, you know, we saw the rise of something called Substack, which allows journalists to charge a subscription service to access their online newsletter. And many of them are finding, now you have to be a good journalist to do it, that they're making more money, uh, you know, doing a subscription-based email newsletter than actually working at a big network. Uh, journalists, many journalists have brands unto themselves. We saw Bill Simmons famously get fired from ESPN and start a podcast that was recently sold to Spotify for $150 million. So, you know, we're starting to see, um, individuals that are, that are journalists kind of lean into the power of their own personal brand and go direct the consumer. And I think we're going to start to see that happen more and more that that journalists understand that they can access information and reporting from other sources and basically be a reporter that people follow versus maybe a network that people follow. And I think that's going to be something that's going to happen. I think you're going to start to see more and more brands step into the political arena. I don't think they have a choice anymore. Just today, Airbnb announced that they're going to be blocking and canceling reservations in Washington, D.C. Uh, during the inauguration, uh, given all the security concerns. I think you're going to start to see more and more companies step in the political fold, whether they want to or not. It's going to be they're going to be backed into a corner. And they're going to have to, um, you know, we saw it happen with the social unrest that happened over the summer where companies dove in. I think now they're going to dive more so in the political arena for better or for worse. I just think that's the world we live in. And I think you're going to start to see more and more of that moving forward. Um, so to wrap everything up and thank you guys for sticking with me this long. I think there are three aspects that consumers want moving forward uh, in terms of, you know, what's important to them. Consumers are going to want speed. They're going to want things that they can get right now because they've grown accustomed to it. They're going to want safety because while the pandemic uh, may be kind of um, winding down in terms of the amount of new cases and deaths from it, et cetera, safety will always be on consumers' minds. And lastly, they're going to want connection. They're going to want to be around other people and feel emotionally connected. And I think for brands to be able to win moving forward, they're going to have to play in at least two of these three concentric circles. They're going to have to be a company that provides safety and speed, safety and connection, or speed and connection. And there's a variety of companies that I think um, are doing it well. Um, and I think that companies really need to understand that consumers want things and they want things now. They want to feel that they're in a safe environment, um, or at least that the companies are paying attention to this new world we're living in. But ultimately, they're going to be yearning that connection and, again, that excitement that they've so desperately been missing um, during this pandemic. So that's all I have for you guys. I hope that everyone got a lot of value. And I think, Abel, now we're going to be turning it over to questions. And I'm going to take a drink of water while I'm waiting for Abel to pop up. Okay. 
And while we're waiting for Abel, I'm going to actually um, start to go into some questions. Okay, so the first question is from Tim, who's saying, wow, malls and stores will become corporate and hubs of community. The empty space is an opportunity for so much urban evolution, less about retail transaction, purposeful coming together. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think that, you know, I think that many people are going to start to look at uh, companies as sort of like a community in their own right. I think that you know, people are going to look at brands as they currently do as places to kind of commune around and build communities around. And I think companies moving into kind of corporate structures like malls is really just the start of it. Um, and it'll be interesting to see where that happens. Um, Ebony asked the question, I don't see the mention of VR. Where does that fall into the insights you saw and what was predicted? It's a great point, Ebony. I mean, I can't really obviously uh, mention every single trend. Uh, VR has been something that, you know, supposedly was going to be popping up uh, for a very long time and it really hasn't yet. I do think uh, during this past year, we did see in that during the holiday seasons that um, Facebook's Oculus was a tremendously successful, um, you know, holiday launch. It, it wasn't really launch, but their their uh, recent version of their hardware device. I think it remains to be seen. I think VR is all about the content and the use cases, and those are things that are kind of we don't really know what's going to happen in terms of how consumers are going to use VR. Oh, there's Abel. You popped up. Sorry about I that. Getting, I was getting worried about you for a second. Issue that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, got okay. it. All right, awesome. So next question for you, Matt. So uh, obviously malls and, and a lot of those retail stores have started to become a little bit empty. Um, wh what do you see as big opportunities for those spaces that are obviously um, pretty massive in these communities? So, I mean, we were just talking about that when I think you were trying to get on. I think that brands could take them over and brands could very well build communities around these shopping malls where they can kind of, you know, imagine if Amazon bought a shopping mall and featured all the local retailers that were selling and they could subsidize the food court and subsidize those areas. So I think you're going to start to see just like how I think that Netflix could get in the movie theaters, big brands, fast going brands. Like I wouldn't be surprised if Peloton bought a chain of gyms, right? So New York sports club, I think recently fired filed for bankruptcy. Why wouldn't Peloton buy that? You know, again, the same way that a company like Warby Parker, you know, fast got into, um, you know, retail. So I think you're going to start to see more and more of that moving forward for sure. Yeah, it's interesting because Amazon has their now the four star um, stores yeah. that they've actually stopped to po populate a lot of different malls, um, which has been a pretty cool thing there. Absolutely. Um, Matt, so this is a question for you about someone that's curious about how B2B companies can best navigate during this time. Obviously, as a leader of a B2B company, um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, we talked about sort of like the four phases of this year and how right now what consumers need is hope and then they're going to need optimism. And then in the summer, they're probably going to need some direction um, because of the freneticism. And then really, you know, the activation in the fall where hopefully we're going to be able to get back to some sense of normalcy. I think that B2B companies have to follow on that path. But I think ultimately the job of a B2B marketer, and really any marketer, is to understand you know, what the unmet need is of your, of your customer and where can you sort of fill in? So for Susie, we see an unmet need of businesses really being out of touch with the consumer because things have changed so fast. And we have a tool that can deliver upon that unmet need. And that's why we're doing this webinar today, right? So I think every, and, and we're doing it to basically try to build our brand and, and add value. So I think this is sort of the way I think B2B companies need to be acting is figure out how they can add value to their customer. Definitely. Um, interesting question here. So as people are doing more price comparison shopping um, via e-commerce, do you think that brands will become um, less important in the future when people have just so many more options and uh, available to them? It's really interesting. Somebody uh, named Webb Smith, who's really great sort of trend futurist I follow on Twitter, said that he was at an airport the other day and there were 15 people in line at McDonald's. And then there was like a no name store next to it with nobody in line. And they each were selling basically the same thing, yet everybody was waiting in line at McDonald's. And so, in a world where so many people are sort of questioning the value of brands, you still see things like that happen. So, I think that there are certain brands that have built enough equity with consumers, um, say like Coca Cola, right? That um, 
or American Express, right? These companies is going to be very hard to really dislodge people who are used to using their products. Um, where other businesses, let's just say, I don't know, I'm afraid to mention a, a brand because we work with so many companies, but say a cable service that has very poor customer service, right? That people don't really care about the brand. I think they are much more at risk. Um, so I, and I, it really kind of goes across the board, but we did see during the pandemic, some consumers try new brands because the brands that they love were just out of stock, but we're not seeing that as much right now. Definitely. Um, so one of the things that you talked about a little bit earlier was trade shows like CES and people not really sending people to that. Um, so one of the people brought up the fact that it's pretty challenging to build kind of professional relationships in um, that community in a digital setting. So how do you think you can kind of uh, bridge those two, uh, that gap there between digital and also people's right. hunger for connection? So, yeah, I mean, I think that's why I also think it's very hard to build personal relationships at CES when there's 100,000 people there, um, which is why I think there will be events, but I think there'll be more intimate and more focused on forming your relationships. So I think that comment's spot on. Um, I do think that people are going to need those physical events and serendipity to build relationships, but I don't think the large conferences really produce that. I think, you know, you see at many large, large conferences, companies like MediaLink kind of creating like a show within a show to actually you know, facilitate those relationships. And I think that's good. what MediaLink does at conferences is going to be more like what conferences themselves look like moving forward. Definitely. Um, what careers or industry verticals do you think are moving towards uh, extinction during the pandemic? So we talked about specialty retail, bricks and mortar specialty retail. I think that's definitely one area. I think a lot of the banks are really going to have to reinvent their models. But most of them are well capitalized. So I'm, I don't know if they're going to be headed towards extinction, but ones that really rely on that sort of retail foot traffic to drive business, I think they're really you know, they're going to be challenged to get new mortgage applications and challenged to get new loan applications when, when people are looking for new mortgages, they're going to go on Google. And the companies like, you know, Rocket Mortgage that have built their whole infrastructure around sort of a digital footprint and focus on SEO and paid media, they're going to be the ones that are winning new business, not the banks that have, you know, all these locations that they're willing, that they're hoping people are going to want to stop by. So I think that's going to be one that I'm really going to want to look at moving forward as well. But again, any business that doesn't really have that digital infrastructure is going to hurt. I worry about a lot of small businesses and cities. I think that one thing we've seen during the pandemic is you see the Chipotle's and McDonald's, you know, and the Starbucks and Dunkin' do just fine. But the local coffee shops really hurt um, because they don't have that loyalty and digital infrastructure, et cetera. And I worry about that moving forward. You know, the one thing they have going for them is the cost of real estate is going to be dropping dramatically in a lot of cities. But I think that a lot of local businesses are really going to struggle coming out of it. And I think that it's who really needs the most help. Yeah, that's actually a very interesting question there. So how do you think some of those smaller businesses can even survive when they're going against someone like, um, you know, with multi-million dollar ad budgets or digital infrastructure there? Like, what do they do? I think they really need to focus on personal relationships and scaling the unscalable. They need, you know, somebody who is running a local business needs to as much as they can know the names of their customers and have a presence on Twitter and know that they can be the person that can help. I think they, if I'm running a hardware store, I want to launch services where not only going to sell you tools, but if you need it, I will walk you through over a zoom how to, you know, retile your kitchen or I'll send someone there. So I think they need to think a little bit differently um, and really lever into the value of experience and relationships so they can differentiate from their larger competitors. Definitely. Um, well, I, I know the answer to this one, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. You mentioned people will continue to eat at home, get groceries delivered. Do you think it will be the same for drinking slash going to bars? Um, do you think people will want that, that social setting slash excitement again? 100%. <laughs> I think that people, I mean, what have, I mean, you're a young, cool millennial able, like you live in New York city. When you can go to a bar again, are you going to want to go? You tell me. Oh, I'm going to be standing in line. I'll be the first person with a vaccine standing in line for that. So I, I don't. Go being a, a place at all. Um, all right. Next question here is how do you think things like voice and Alexa will continue to shape the consumer this year? So voice has been something that was, I think, oversold where so many people is like, oh, it's going to be voice of the future, voice is everything, et cetera. I don't know about you, but 70% of the time I ask Alexa something, she gets it wrong. <laughs> right. So like, I, I just still don't think it works well enough. And I don't think that's how I think humans are visual 
And I would never order toothpaste over Alexa. You know, there's certain things I, I use Alexa for like, you know, a timer or a random facts or things like that. But I think it's fairly limited use case. So I'm not huge on that right now. I think that the use cases still have to be ironed out in a lot more of a cohesive way for consumers. Yeah. Uh, next question here. Are there any sectors or consumer categories that you foresee will be further democratized? Um, consumers are now being empowered uh, with uh, and want more transparency. Um, and there might be kind of this power shift from uh, legacy brands into like the voice of the consumer. What do you think of something like that? Well, I mean, first of all, at Suzy, that's why we exist is to help democratize market research. You know, that's an example. We, before Suzy, if you went to conduct market research, you had to hire an expensive firm and you had to be a specialist. And now all of a sudden, anybody can do market research. A company like Squarespace or Wix democratizes the notion of building a website. Instead of having to hire a services firm or ad agency to build a website, anybody can build a website on Squarespace. Companies like MailChimp did the same, you know, with email marketing. So, and then now you have these companies like Fiverr, right, which allow you to basically access a network of freelancers or 99 designs, get anything designed or anything done. Um, so I think all these tools and marketplaces really put the power in the hands of the consumer and democratizes things that maybe were once out of touch. And I do think that's only going to continue to be a trend moving forward. Yeah. Um, it, kind of interesting for a lot of people who are here for the first time, they're kind of curious, uh, what exactly is Suzy? Uh, what are different ways that companies use Suzy? Um, yeah. They're just a little curious about that. Sure. Well, first of all, welcome to everyone who's here for the first time. I'm not going to talk too much about Suzy because we do have so many people that are on this webinar that know about Suzy, but it is an on-demand market research tool. We work with uh, nearly 300 leading enterprises who use Suzy to essentially get the voice of the consumer instantly. Uh, we have an always, do always on, on-demand panel of over a million US consumers you can target by any census-based criteria and instantly get feedback to any idea or, or, or question that you have. So it's really about empowering consumers um, to basically have the, empowering businesses that the voice of the consumer at all times, you know, in their pocket so they can make sure that they're assuming nothing as we like to say. So, um, and I know that Abel, you posted a link on how to get a demo of Susie uh, within this chat. Definitely. Um, so one of the questions that someone has is, um, what do you think brands can do that have traditionally relied on brick and mortar retail to help expedite the rate of return to uh, in-person shopping? I think you need to add experiences. I think if your store is only about the product you're selling, then people are just going to buy it on Amazon. Right. It's like, you know, I went to a Best Buy with my son to buy him something over the holidays. They didn't have it. He told me he'd go back in the storeroom and he'd be right back and tell me if they could find it. He never came back out. We found something else. We had to wait in line. Like it was just, it just, you know, wasn't a great experience. And I basically stood there and ordered a, ordered the product on Amazon. And I got it the next day while I was in that store. Right. So I, I think that can't happen. Right. If you want to be a physical retailer, you need to make it a seamless, pleasant experience, like what you get at a Warby Parker, like what you get at an Apple store. Right. Um, and I think that's what these companies that want to have, you know, a physical brick and mortar presence need to do. It needs to be convenient, it needs to be fast, and there needs to be an experience that you can get at the store, like the genius bar, right? That you're not gonna be able to get if you just shop online. Definitely. Um, so I, I know we talked a little bit about this in kind of one of our previous webinars, but do you see any trends uh, within kind of mobile shopping space versus traditional desktop? So one thing we've seen during the pandemic is huge adoption of desktop. People thought that the desktop was dead and then everyone was stuck at home. And now everybody has, not everybody, but a lot of people bought desktop computers and they bought them for their kids, et cetera. And we saw a big shift to desktop shopping. Um, I'm not sure that, we're going to continue to see that as people aren't stuck at home as much. Um, but I do think that now companies need to look at really an omni-channel experience. They need to look at the desktop. They need to look at the mobile device. And they need to look at their retail footprint to figure out how to best create an experience that works for the consumer and really differentiates them. Definitely. Um, so Matt, you mentioned a little bit of pent up, uh, demand for travel, um, versus kind of this idea of less international travel. Where do you really see the biggest opportunity within the travel industry? I think it's, I think it's companies in places where consumers want to travel domestically, helping consumers have the best possible experience. I think 
there's going to be one thing I, I was going to put in a slide and I didn't, I think that luxury, the luxury markets are going to boom again. Right. So like you go on fifth Avenue now and you see Louis Vuitton and Prada and Cartier and Tiffany, and these companies have really struggled as well. People weren't really buying luxury goods uh, as much during this period. And I think they're going to make a comeback, but I also think luxury travel is going to make a comeback. And in a world where many people can't travel internationally or maybe or less likely to, and it may be less with the luxury market because they can afford the expensive tickets, right? But I do think there'll be much more domestic luxury travel, for example. And I think that that creates an opportunity for you know key domestic locations to actually create new services for these people. So I think that's, that's for example, one, one thing that I think will probably start to get a lot of action in 2021. Definitely. Um, one final question for you, maybe from a college student here, but what careers have expanded or have been created during the pandemic, uh, which will survive it? Um, basically people are trying to make a bet of where they should go with their career right now. If they want to be in the right industry, right place. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've long said that I think, and I still feel this way coming out of the pandemic and I've been saying this forever on stage is that I feel like that you need to go deep into an art or deep into a science to be able to succeed moving forward. I think people who, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a second, but I think the days of being a jack of all trades and master of none is kind of over. I think companies are looking for specialized skill sets that can help them get specific things done. So what I mean by deep into an art and deep into a science, going deep into an art is essentially doing something that a machine can't, right? Being a designer, being a writer, being creative. Machines, will never really be able to do that as good as humans. And I think you really need to understand um, how you can differentiate yourself from automation, right? And I think going deep into an art is one way to do it. The other way is going deep into a science, which is understanding how to code, build, and operate the machines. I think right. that there are going to be people on the technical side that are going to need to understand how to do, um, you know, programmatic media buying or search engine optimization or, you know, uh, co mobile coding or app development or things of that nature. I think that's the other area right now. All that being said, you need to understand how to manage people, how to inspire people, how to work with other people, et cetera. But I think in terms of specialties, those are the two areas. And I do think, uh, despite what I said about colleges and universities making a comeback, you are will also see a rise in interest of trade schools as people understand that learning those trades and skill sets are going to be just continually on the in demand by some of these large companies as they try to digitize. Um, you know, for the for the decade ahead. Definitely. Um, well, Matt, that's all the, all the questions I have for you. But thank you again for this very inspiring presentation. I know throughout the chat. Um, people kept saying that this was uh, incredibly uh, invigorating, gave them a lot to think about. Awesome. Well, Abel, again, thank you for everything you do. Happy birthday. Everyone, thank please, you. Uh, you know, join me in wishing Abel a happy birthday. So I want to thank you and I want to thank uh, the rest of the Suzy team for all their continual hard work and to everyone who took the time to join today. Really appreciate it. We're going to be um, coming back with many of these during 2021. But in the meantime, I hope everybody stays happy and healthy and safe. And uh, we will be in touch real soon. So on behalf of Abel Flint, myself, Matt Britton, and the whole Suzy team, thank you. And until next time, and we will be sharing a, a copy of the recording of this as well for people who are asking. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone.